Hi, everybody. This is Kathy L. Murphy, the Pulpa Queen. I'm reporting live from a little cabin in the woods here in East Texas called Murphy's Law. And we're doing this again because last week, we don't know why, but we had a glitch with Zoom and it just went off and couldn't get back on. So we rescheduled for this Saturday with Janet Oakley and you're in for a real treat. Uh, we have two other authors here with us today, Kathy Ramsberger and Eileen Sanchez. Hi, everybody. And we hope more will jump on. But if not, we always post our recorded uh, videos up on YouTube on my Kathy L. Murphy channel. So you can watch it at your own leisure and have watch parties. But I'm going to let Janet introduce herself and tell us again about her wonderful um, life story and um, She's going to give us a little workshop on how to do historical research, which she is an expert at. So uh, Janet, welcome this morning to our Writers Club. Well, thank you so much. And I'm happy to be back. So uh, I, I'm really passionate about writing historical fiction. And I always tell people that I grew up in a family that uh, collected things. I've got stories from my ancestor who came over in 1638 to Newburyport, and I'm very proud that he came from Upper Nether Wallop, which is <laughs> north of Salisbury. And we know the ship he came on and he ran a tavern, which is still standing in Newburyport. So I knew that story. There was something my Nana in Boise, Idaho was so interested in. And then I've always grown up in stories on my dad's side about the Civil War sur Union surgeon, um, W.F. Osborne, that's my maiden name, Osborne, and he was a country doctor who went off to join the 11th PA and his second month in the army as a assistant surgeon was at the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, so that heavily influenced my writing. I'm actually working on a, a, a novel set in the Northwest, but it's based on his, his time there. So uh, I think I was always interested in history. I ended up getting a history degree on uh, US history at Kalamazoo College. And then I went off to Hawaii, uh, lived there for eight and a half years. And that also influenced me uh, getting interested in um, the history there and actually how it relates to the Pacific Northwest. So I'm exploring that in my Pacific Northwest novels, Mischievous especially, which is set in the San Juan Islands. And there were Hawaiians there. I'm now working with the National Park. I wrote the Pig War curriculum for them. And a pig war is a big deal here in the Northwest because it was who owns the islands. Is it the British or is it the United States? In 1859, you know, who owns it? And it's because they didn't have a treaty about the water boundary. But anyway, Kanakas are there. I'm hoping to, when we bring back English encampment this summer, we'll have people from my, my town who are Hawaiian descent or associated to Hawaii who can uh, tell that story. So I'm gonna talk about how I research and, and what I look for because we always start with story uh, and story can be in any place in time. I have a friend who's writing by the Hittites and that's gotta be deep uh, research. You know, how do you do that? And really when I started off uh, with my first novel which was The Using Affair, I would never had written a novel in my life but I was trained as a historian and I got a story idea and one book helped me figure out what should be in the story. And then I was fortunate to interview people. So I'll just start it. And you know, if you wanna ask a question, maybe Kathy can monitor that okay. um, and we'll just go. So it's bringing history to life, creating a research plan. So of course we all know all stories are set in place and time. And Kathy always said, it's all about the story. And so in historical pieces, we need to know where the heck we are. And uh, I always, uh, when I teach this, I always said for myself as well, you need to ask questions. And one of the important things is what period am I writing in? Uh, what is the technology and media of the time? Because you are going to be creating a world, even though the world is fact-based, you need to know how your characters move through that world. Even people, you know, who write nonfiction so wonderfully. Um, Eric Larson is a great example. He, he can just bring stuff to life uh, and telling a historical story, but also, you know, you get the sense of the time. So you need to know about transportation, how people get around, how the Hittites get around and what do they eat, eat costumes and etiquette. 
So I write stories set in three different regions, the Pacific Northwest. I'll be back to that hopefully at the end of this year. I've written about Hawaii and also its connection to the Pacific Northwest. And I'm currently in Norway. And I love this. It's a Kathy, this is Trondheim. It's, I just love Trondheim. It's in the middle of the country. I also write in different time periods. So I've got to know what the heck is going on in my place, and but what is it like in that particular time thing? So just a quickie, in the Pacific Northwest, I've written th three novels. Uh, the first one actually was uh, Tree Soldier, which is 1935. And then and I went- I'm gonna interrupt just a second. Are you using a PowerPoint yet? Yes, I started already. Have you guys, can you see it? No. Oh, okay. Here we go again. Okay. I just wanted to, I thought I knew when you were talking about the books, you'd showed pictures of your books. So we're not seeing it. Okay. We had this glitch last we time. We had the same problem. It's, I have share screen on. Yeah. Um, Here we'll do it. There we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, now I don't know which. I'm going to start from here because I have been okay. talking. Okay. Good. So, um, I apologize, that was my fault. Oh, I just caught it just in time. <laughs> well, here we go again. Anyway, this is what's kind of fun about all these things because this happens in teaching too. I've been a substitute teacher, and you know, things happen. So I'll start from here, just okay. talking about the book. So 1907, Women Climbing Mountains in Skirts. That's actually, I think it's Mount Rainier behind them in 1907. That was taken in 1906. And then Mischievous is 1860. Norway, 1940 to 1946. What was that? What do I need to know? So you have a story idea. And what do you do now? Well, you should have a kind of a research plan. And that can be any kind of thing when you're talking about a research plan. Um, I, sometimes in workshops, I have just a hand out a sheet and I will have some stuff available I'm gonna to give to Mandy and okay. she could put it in the newsletter, you know, sort of basic things to look for. But you know, what are you writing about? And actually sometimes when you write even a chapter, you need to know what am I writing about in this chapter? What is the goal in this chapter? But the overall thing is when does it take place? Well, let's say the latest one I'm working on takes place in Bergen, Norway in the year of 1940, uh, to, uh, 42 I'm looking at. And what do I know so far? What do I know about that? Well, I know that the Germans are cracking down and so I have basic stuff that I need to know, but then you kind of organize it. And then is what do I need to find out about this time? So here's some examples. This is a fishing village in, uh, in about 1943. Uh, this wonderful cover uh, is during the uh, World, World War II. You know, at Saturday Union Post just put the most wonderful graphics on their covers. This, 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 just, this is a story right here just in that. And then I love um, The Last Kingdom, which is on Netflix about the Vikings in Britain and stuff I never knew. And then where will I look? That's the big question. So there's two types of information. There's primary sources that happen during the time. So you have, uh, you have participants and witnesses. So for example, my great grandfather's journals, which I grew up on, which he wrote during the Civil War. I also have his journals from when he was a country doctor in Missouri. And, um, but anyway, it has a POV. It, uh, this includes personal papers, photographs. I'm sitting here right in front of me, photographs that my grandfather, this surgeon's son, uh, took in 1908, 1909 in New Mexico. He was, uh, he was a pharmacist there. And then the other one is the secondary sources. And these happen after. Uh, it's explain, you know, the history to somebody. So I always say, start with second stories first. So just sort of read about the era, try to find people that are experts because these books can give uh, context to historical periods. So I really approach you seeing this novel set in Norway during World War II from a lot of memoirs of people that were writing in the 50s about their experience in the resistance. And then the, by, by the 70s, you start, the 60s, you start seeing you know, professors in Norway translate English or people here locally, uh, how to, uh, telling the story, the broader picture, it gives a broader picture. And it's really important, uh, I take notes, we can talk about that. 
uh, you can work uh, through a whole belt uh, bookshelf. And I did this at my public library. I went through the whole shelf at the public library on stuff from Scandinavia during World War II. So it wasn't just Norway, it was Sweden, because uh, they have a strong connection, both good and bad. Uh, if your library doesn't have a book, my favorite thing is ask a librarian. It's uh, most, they may word it differently on the library website, but go ask them a question. And what's really cool about this program is that you might be writing at, uh, you know, let's say 10 o'clock in the afternoon, but there may be someone who is already awake for several hours back east and they'll, they'll go look it up. For example, I needed to know what this place looked like on Coconut Island in Hilo. And I knew, I learned from my husband's uh, uncle, he had been stationed in Hilo during World War II. And he told us when he came for our wedding, he said, they used to have lights over there and they had all this stuff. I thought about that for almost 50 years. What was that? So all I did was ask a librarian and they sent me scanned copies out of a out non, it's not published anymore, it's out of print about, it shows the soldier on the bridge to Coconut Island. It shows some of the buildings on Coconut Island. Of course, when we lived there, they were all gone. It was back to being a state park, but uh, that's great. Bibliographies are really important. Go look at the back. And you know, in the old school days, cause it's so different now, you go to the library and you get out a reel of microfilm and you can look up the most recent published uh, magazines or stuff that was printed in 1943. And now it's all digital. You just hit a button and bop it um, off the it goes. But the library is a great resource. And then of course now, you know, when I first started out, there was no internet. I went up to Western, which is up on my hill, and I would ask the librarian if they could order some stuff for me. And uh, and so now you can just go find anything. I'm having conversations with historians in Norway, and they're so generous. They send me stuff, and I go look here and I go look there. But one of the things you want to look for, you want to look for uh, things that are org or edu at the end, because that means it's associated with a museum, or uh, maybe a university library that specializes in a per personal thing. Like here at Western in Bellingham, they now have a collection on fly fishing of all things. They have some of the great artists uh, who do, uh, he was in Montana. They got his whole entire collection that ended up on the cover of you know, a lot of fishing magazines and stuff like that plus journals of one of our very famous steelhead fishermen. But that special collection is there and you can go look at it. Uh, you can even ask the librarian, you know, sometimes for a small fee uh, to send them scanned copies. So that's how you do it. And now Facebook, you know, you can rail about Facebook, but there are some great focus groups that uh, you become a member of and you're all talking about the same thing. Uh, of course, the genealogy societies now have Facebook or you can go to, uh, you know, so let's, I have a friend who's um, of Armenian descent and she's really searching her, her grandparents' story because it wasn't really talked about, about the Armenian, you know, totally, the Turks totally annihilating them and her, her ancestors were able to get out. But so she's searching, she's just, just the other day, she asked about a book that she had heard about and the library scanned it and sent it all to her. And she has some, it was this book that her grandmother wrote uh, or grandmother or, or her great aunt. And they just sent it to her. She just got it yesterday, it's, you know, so it's great. And so my general book for guessing was Blood on the Midnight Sun. And this was written by a professor here in Seattle and a professor in Norway. So when I first learned how to do all this, I had a very strict teacher, Dr. Spencer at Kalamazoo College. He was so old school, but I'm so glad that he was old school because uh, what I, I have a bibliography behind me that is amazing. I have cards and the way, and you can take this idea and translate into however you're collecting your notes today. I personally like to have hard copy because I'm always worried that something's going to happen on the internet and I'm going to hit the wrong button and I'm going to wipe everything out. So, so for you saying, I do have cards like this. And the way I was taught, I'll have a subject, cod fishing, and I have a section on cod fishing. It's so important to fishermen during World War II and before and after. And then number two up there represents the bibliography book 
that I found it in, the resource I found it in, and what page it's on. Uh, and you know, this can be translated in an entirely different way now, whatever source that you use, EndNotes, and I'll show some of the other ones. You also, I also have a subject file because I spent a lot of time at my public library scanning stuff and printing it off. And again, I have marked, I usually mark what the date is, what's the, what's the page if necessary. And I have it right beside me. I, I was so astounded when I started writing Timber Rose that I had collected all this stuff, including a 1911 Rangers map. I forgot I had it. I had half of the Rangers handbook published in 1905. So I had all these little treasures. And the other thing down here at the bottom, library thing is also very good, I think. So if you're uh, revisiting the 1950s and really the 60s, which you're writing in, uh, Eileen, um, it's now considered historical fiction because it's always 50 years behind your existing time. So now you're seeing books in the 50s and the post-World War II and all that. But library thing will help you create uh, bibliographies. And of course the or is, put it on a piece of paper, but mark it. And the reason why we do this is that writing historical fiction, you get gigs. I've been invited to many, many talks. And of course, in the last two years, it's on Zoom, but I am talking to, I belong to the uh, Sons of Norway Lodge in DC, which is connected to the embassy and they get amazing speakers. And I've been invited to be like the person to talk about writing historical fiction in time period. So it's good to have those notes because you go back there and refresh your own memory. And it's also a source of income, frankly. You know, I've been invited in a lot of places and gotten paid. Uh, these are the examples, Scrivener. I don't use Scrivener, but some people love using it uh, because there is something in there that you can organize your notes. Uh, one note is another one, Evernote. And there may be others that uh, are, they're, they're popping up all the time. Uh, some people put their stuff on Google Drive uh, or you know, places like that. You know, there's one, the new one that's from Microsoft. I just got a brand new laptop. So I'm working my way through what it has to offer. Of course, you got to keep track. This is kinky when my intern, when she was about four months old, <laughs> She loved getting into my file, but this is my files on uh, using. And I can pull it out. I have stuff on Gestapo and it's like pages from, you know, books and nonfiction books. I can pull it out. I might even have pictures in there. And this is a new thing I started doing. Uh, I'm starting now as I gather notes, I'm putting it into a journal. Uh, this might be a little more risky. I do not let this leave the house. And when I went to Norway, I had that and I actually, printed them off the pages so I could ask the questions I wanted to ask the historian Trondheim. I spent about four hours with him. This is building up for Quisling Factor. It was about the trial and he was a knowledgeable person. And this one is just showing, I'm trying to keep track of all the squads in the CCC. And I love doing this. I go flip through it. I have little tabs, but I keep it close. Uh, Cause it's a little more risky if I list the book, I'm in trouble. But I also have backup notes. I have stuff printed off that I'm working on the new novel. So this is what I'll probably end up sending to everybody. Um, I started doing this a long time ago because I used to teach teacher workshops and how to do, how to write stories for your classroom. And you know, what did you need to know? And essentially it's a little blurred out there. Mine is, uh, cause that's a picture. But at the top you have, what do I need to know about housing in my, so the first column that's blank is what do I know? So you might know housing, you know, in uh, 1900 Pacific Northwest is that you don't have many brick houses. Uh, a brick house was considered very, very permanent. We had wooden houses, you know, we're cutting down massive trees. It would take 13 men put their arms around some of our trees back in the 1890s. Uh, what was the lighting like? Well, you're writing about the Hittites. Well, what are the Hittites lighting their places with? So what do I know? And what I need to find out is the second column. And you create your own categories. You don't have to stick to this. And it's, uh, you know, so mine was what was like in wartime Norway. What a period newspapers. Now there's sites you can go on and look at a newspaper from all over. Uh, we were, my book, uh, my critique group was talking about it yesterday that you can go online, this organ, I think it's um, newspapers.com. 
Uh, sometimes you have to have a prescription. Apparently, I heard it's free this week, so you might go find it. I'll, I'll get the link and put it into the Facebook, but apparently it's free this week. Yeah. But uh, I think Ancestry might own it, and you might be able to find a newspaper from 1965, whatever you're working on, or I'll be looking at the 1940s. And of course, the main thing is this, how does this affect your characters? They're living through this, but they don't know that we're living through COVID. And we know that, yeah, maybe in 50 years, they're going to look back at this and go like, what happened? Because they were so organized, you know, in 1917 about the flu. And they didn't have the stuff that we have now to take care of us. I just realized that my mom got the flu and she was like um, three years old. Um, mm -hmm. But she, uh, I, I think she had the, the flu. I love what Diana Gabaldon says. She writes Outlander. And she says she likes to start with the clothes. And actually that's a good place to ask questions because that helps you, how do you walk in the clothing that you're wearing? You know, my mom made me a poodle skirt. I have one of those you know, somewhere, <laughs> you know, but you had to wear that crinoline underneath. How do you walk with that sort of thing? You know, but I've been in corsets because I reenact 1860 teacher, school teacher. And what, how does that make your body move? You know, you, so she starts with the clothes and all of that. So just really quickly, I had to know where the heck Norway was because I didn't really know. I didn't know its relationship. And uh, there's Norway there. That's the area I write about. But I'm also talking about the Shetland Islands for you thing. So that black arrow is pointing the Shetland Islands. It's way north of Scotland. But that was a very important place for getting agents to uh, up to uh, Norway. Uh, and bring refugees back. Way at the top, you see way, way up the top, Russia actually pushes right up against, against that. And there's another whole story behind that. They have a special treaty since World War II. And uh, that's another story. So what I need for Timber Rose? Well, I had to know about logging the National Fort fly fishing. Uh, this is a map from 1911 showing parts of the crater, Glacier Creek, my story really takes place in this area. I call it Fraser, but I'm fascinated with the women climbing mountains in skirts. I went down to the University of Washington Library and they have the mountaineers pictures and it's amazing. These women went up in skirts. They were allowed to wear pants underneath their, uh, their skirts. And the joke is that when they got to the glacier, they were allowed to take them off and then they can continue climbing. This is in the very early years. Uh, and I, with global warming, I'm sure they're going to find a hundred skirts up on the glaciers <laughs> with Rainier and Mount Baker. Mount Baker right now is only 40 to 50 miles east of me. It's white. It's gotten at least almost a hundred inches of snow. Uh, it's going to snow this weekend. Uh, we love it because that's our water. Uh, it's our power for our area here. And look at the rangers up on his horse. Mm -hmm. A tree soldier. Well, I, <clears throat> I really fell deeply into the history of this, the Civilian Conservation Corps, but I didn't understand when I first started, why does he have a company name like Company 2842? Well, the company is a sign from where you come. So Company 8, this is the Army District. So if you're from Texas, in this whole area here, that looks like New Mexico, Arizona. This is Army Corps 8. And you got your number if your if your group was assigned to a place. We had a lot of kids come from New uh, New England, mainly New York and New Jersey. They came all the way out to our area. This is Washington. This is Oregon. And you know newspapers. I love the Bulldozer, which is the local CC paper here. I'll send you a copy of that because the Bulldozer is so cool, Kathy. And you know you had to know about stuff like that. <clears throat> Mischievous. Well, I live right here. This is where I live, right up here. My house is probably right there. And this is San Juan Island. Well, they did not have an 1846 treaty about, so this is what I have to know I, and to make it real because I'm world building and someone's gonna check what you're writing about. They're gonna, wait a minute, you can't do that. So sometimes you have to fictionalize things, step back a little bit. Uh, you can put it in your author notes, but I'm really careful that I do not jump all over the place. This is English camp. I've been here many, many times as Miss Libby for 20 years, we set up camp and had wonderful reenactors. The English were here. The Americans were up on this windy hill. This is where Georgie Pickett was from Pickett's Charge. Uh, we had a lot of Southern uh, officers out here 
um, um, in our core. And uh, this is another wonderful place. We have a couple of buildings that are still standing and it's all over a pig. A pig got shot and they had no law on the island. Who do you send the person to to get charged for killing this valuable pig? And of course there are Hawaiians there, but they're also Coast Salish people. We call our area now the Salish Sea. And that includes, you know, Olympic Peninsula of Washington State, it includes Vancouver Island with Victoria. It includes people in Vancouver, BC. Here's George Pickett, probably about 18, probably how he looked uh, when he came out to uh, San Juan Island. And they spoke a jargon. So I had, this is stuff I have to know. I had to know about my mystery. So here's this wonderful picture the librarian in Hilo sent me out of the book. And there's a bridge there today. Uh, and the island, this was, it was called Mokoloa, Mokoloa. And uh, this was a sacred place of Hawaiians. It became a state park. So I had to figure all this stuff out. How do I put this in this story without not flooding it with facts? Because that's the other piece. You just don't slam people with stuff. This is what you need to know. Uh, and I have to say that gun right there for Quisling, a friend of mine, I have so many guns in Quisling and I don't know how to fire a gun. So it turns out one of my Starbucks buddies where I was always writing, uh, he's an expert. And one day he said, I will take you up to the firing range. And I, he showed me how to fire off these World War II guns with live ammunition. I was scared to death. I thought I was gonna kill him but he showed me how to get the safety off. Um, we used um, the type that the Norwegian resistance had, the Germans had, you know, secret police. A lot of them used the same guns, it's kind of interesting. And we decided on one for Anna in that story because, and I was like, Anna, I was terrified. And she's terrified of handling a gun, but she's gonna have to save the person she loves. And uh, so I found out that, wow, that thing's really heavy and wow, I'm now I'm watching police stories because you have to hold your, you never put your finger in the trigger hole, they call it. I didn't even know it had a name. And I learned all this stuff. So it sort of floats through the story. It's stuff I learned and it's real. So that's a lot of blobbing about that. So when you do a lot of um, digging, you know, I, this is uh, you thing, but I had to look into how were people af affected by rationing, but you know, if you're writing about the 60s, what's going on in the 60s? Well, by 66, we're fully involved uh, in the Vietnam War and it's affecting stuff back at home. My husband was a Vietnam vet. He was 19 years old when he went over to Vietnam. So when I was a student in France, his student training was in Vietnam and he was there for 10 months and then returned to mainland. And one of my favorite things is not Generator. I didn't even know the name until about five years ago but I was fascinated by these furnaces on the backs of these cars in Norway. It ran on wood and you go to the gas station, pick up your, buy your bundle of charcoal and wood. So I you find fun things too. That's what's so cool about historical fiction. You find something that's really cool and no one knew about that. Uh, and so you kind of figure out how to put it in there. There were women who were uh, smuggling in um, quinine from the North to the South and they put it in their crinoline. So of course I have that in my new novel. <laughs> it, it's, that's what's the fun part about it. So we're world building, but we're building with facts. So primary sources, here's some examples. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great books that are put out by UK Osborne. I don't know, they're four kids. Yeah, look at that. That's the Norwegian uh, sign. So it's based on ASL, which we use in the United States. I, could, I went into the whole history of deaf culture in Europe, finally to Norway. And I got to visit in person the school that's in my book. Of course, my, my school is different, but I got, was able to talk. It's now the National Deaf, Mute, uh, deaf um, Museum. Uh, one of the men I interviewed, he gave me his bunker cart because he was working for the bunkers. Uh, and this shows that he get this punched out. He gave that to me, which is so sweet. I mean, people are sweet. I used a British, uh, this is my primary. This was published by a British um, Naval Intelligence. I, this is telling you, it's so small, Kathy, so maybe I'll just send it to you. But <laughs> uh, what's so amazing, and this is the train schedule. So when my character gets on the train, I know at that particular stop that they have buffet. You know, 
And they, this is all for the this is all for the agents. Everything you want to know. I have maps. I mean, the maps are amazing. Also, what was interesting, I was able to get actually my own library and then interlibrary actual newspapers and per periodicals at the time. So I actually knew if you've been watching Atlantic Crossing on uh, it was on PBS. Uh, I knew uh, really right off the bat that Princess Mark was also at the, with FDR during this time period. So th this is amazing. And if you look at the date, May 13th, this is before France fell. France falls in June, but already Norway's occupied. This is damaged in Norway. Mm. National Geographic, I was able to get those up. Again, they all have a uh, ripping with a purpose in mind. And what I was always taught was the rule of three. You try to get three different resources, whatever it is, to see if it matches up. And actually, um, it's a good thing. So it could be, a, maybe you read about something in the Newsweek and say, well, that's interesting. So you try to find some other place. It could even be someone's comment in, uh, in a journal. But you want to have at least three different resources uh, to match it up. And, you know, maybe people think this is picky, but I try to really create, uh, try to get it right. Uh, and I've had Norwegians compliment me that, wow, you got my city right. Well, I'm thinking, well, 1942 spy maps, that really helps, you know, but, uh, but now you can, there's so many resources available now that you can contact somebody. I'm in touch with someone who's an expert on submarines. I just need to know a tiny little detail that will make it right. And then, uh, you know, so I, I'm picky, but I get rewarded by people saying, you got it right. And if I'm not sure, I may not put that quite in the story. I may, I'll step back a little bit. Maybe the character is wondering about something, but I, I don't quite know the answer to that. This is really interesting. So this one, I, I just got real copies of this. This is News of Norway. And um, I don't think it's online. I actually have the actual copies. Uh, but um, this was put out daily, um, weekly by an information service in Washington, DC. And so this is 1942. So in, I know that in 1942, that uh, they, uh, Quisling and the Germans went really hard. They started getting, just arresting Jews. And many of them escaped, but they had a very small population. They figured maybe 1,700 to 2,000 Jewish people lived in Norway. And um, most of them got out, about 700 were rounded up, which is very sad. So they're talking about the Nazi uh, state police and uh, that's called the Stapo in, uh, in Norway. This is another interesting one. And this is the interesting, this shows point of view really well. I just found this out. And so I'm writing this new book. I see, I have deaf culture running through all the novels. And so I was really curious, well, what's going on in Bergen, you know? And my, my spy map showed a place that said of Salem. Well, in the 1940s, that could be an institute. And it turns out today that is where the deaf institute is. But I found that it's a different place. But this is very interesting. A person sent this to me, he said, look this up. This gentleman is named Bernd Skiller. And he taught at the deaf school. It turns out it's downtown uh, Bergen, the association there. And what this is saying, because uh, I, I use Google Translate a lot. I also have a really good friend who's Norwegian. We'll sit down, go through stuff. But it's saying, oh, isn't this sad? He was a wonderful teacher. And we're so sorry he passed away. So this is a national uh, thing for the deaf that was still allowed to be published during the occupation. But the truth is, came out after 1946, because now it's online, and I went and found the article. It turns out he died of torture. Oh, no. And he was, not only that, uh, this, he's this, he looks like a mild-mannered person. He was a courier for MILORG, which is the military resistance organization. And so now I'm basing a character on him. I, it, it just almost broke my heart. And this word dove means deaf. So this is, it said, this is a new banner, something rather for the deaf. Maybe it's talking about this up here. There's, you know, there, one person who I got finally in touch with, the deaf association, he got so excited. He said, 
you're writing about deaf culture in Norway. How can I help you? Oh, now, you know, it's amazing. So my character knows my main protect knows how to sign because of his um, uncle. Anyway, this the the guy in the picture that died that was tortured he looks like a film star and i'm trying to think who it is oh i know who you're thinking of oh i know who you're thinking of. he's british he looks just like him oh, he's british oh, yes oh he was in gone with the wind was he that actor in gone with the wind yes uh ashley yeah ashley what's his name he was in a lot of world war ii movies as well yes. yeah oh, he God, does look like, like him I can't even think of it. Well, we'll think of it. Keep we'll going. We'll think about it. Anyway, so, I mean, so that's a story. It's a point of view. They're putting something out. It's not telling the whole story. It just said he died in pneumonia, but he literally was horribly. And he's honored in Bergen. There is a place for him where he is honored. There were several other people. And again, it was historians there that guided me to look this up, find this out. So one interesting one is John Steinbeck wrote The Moon is Down. I don't know if you ever read that. It's a very short book. It was made into a movie about 1943, I think. So this is from the, uh, from the movie. And I've actually, I think the last time I looked at it, you might even be able to find it on YouTube. But uh, anyway, it's a short book. It never says it's Norway, but everybody knows it's Norway. He's writing about an occupied area. And there's about someone who's a quizzling and there's there's stuff going on. It's about how a village just finally stands up to the occupation. And uh, but anyway, it first was a book. Then it became a play. Then it became a movie. It was a huge hit. And in Norway, they would smuggle mimeograph copies of the novel into Norway. And it gave people hope. Uh, that's the other thing you don't you're occupied but you don't know what's going on outside did you find oh yes leslie howard that's leslie howard oh, oh he looks God. just like him oh that's my god that's so like funny. <laughs> maybe he was modeled after him anyway so another book everybody reads this in uh fifth grade it was a really popular book the snow treasure because the norwegians were able to get the gold out that's another amazing story they got all the gold out of the bank smuggled it past the germans why they're bomb the germans are bombing everything and they got the gold it ended up in baltimore maryland and there was a huge fight well it doesn't belong to you because we're the we're the government now uh, i mean it's an amazing story it's a great story but it's kind of made up story but it's a great story and then, of course, you had all these movies started coming out. Uh, I think I watched this once, uh, Waterloo Bridge. Robert uh, Taylor, what a yeah, hell. Rob, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you should do this one, Kathy. I fun. should for a book. You know, you should do some World War Two, do some World War Two movies. You know, I, I, Walter Pigeon was in one that I loved. Um, I know which one you're talking about. It's about the family that's bombed. Yeah, and actually, that was extremely popular in Sweden. So oh, you could, really? You could, you could I have to look movies. that one up. I, you I'm could not watch. It. Yeah, you could not watch movies. Uh, they were English, uh, British, American, uh, anybody who was Jewish. You just that was totally banned. But it was very this movie was very popular in Sweden. So a lot of the agents that went over there to kind of do R&R, &R, they would go because the lights are on in Sweden and everything's fine in Sweden. And uh, they would go watch movies and stuff like that. Anyway, so again, these have POV, but you look at it because you get a sense of what people are thinking about. Uh, even the cartoons are talking a lot about the, uh, you know, the, the Bugs Bunny and uh, things like that. Some of them they don't even want to show anymore because they're, you know, they show people walking, you know, goose stepping through towns. But anyway, today the focus is largely on France and the home front. But uh, Norway, uh, I found that people were really concerned about Norway and all the uh, stuff that's published in the newspapers and, you know, everything from, you know, National Geographic, they really looked at that. The other thing that's so helpful are photographs. So this is the Arthur, very famous. The shell and bus used to look like this. Uh, here's a not generator on the back. It's a furnace. Uh, here's, you know, these, a lot of these things now are available, but, you know, back, uh, these also come from the internet and there's so much now being put up by museums, a lot of 
stuff going off. This is, um, this is a hidden radio that was put into a can. It just fits right in there. Uh, this is a setter. So these are places where a lot of the resistance. And this is actually published by the Nazis, getting people to join. This is really cool. This is a ski battalion and you can be, you can, uh, they will never touch us. Another thing too, if you're writing in different eras, you can also go look at fine art. This is where you get into the clothes. So when you look at this one famous um, picture, you know, everything from the details on the table, how is her clothing wear? She's probably wearing a corset. It was actually a board. It's like wood that kind of held you up and you're wearing a chemise and then you have it's almost a little like a dicky collar that we used to do with a little Peter Pan. It slips down inside of your dress on top of your chemise. And you know how, how her particular cap, that also might say something about her class or station. And then this is, um, I don't know, who, this is an old painting. It may be from the 19th century, but you get an idea of how women dress, especially women that are upper class uh, in Japan. Uh, and then these are graphics that come from the medieval period. And even though they're, you know, they look primitive to us, you can see a lot of stuff happening here. These are serfs. They're sickling probably the wheat from the way it looks there. But look at the design in the back because a lot of these medieval places had tiles or painting, painted surfaces. I love watching Time Team. Have you ever watched Time Team? It yeah, is the plan. Yeah. It's on YouTube. It's was it's Time at, King. It's called Time Team. And it's a bunch of archaeologists that have three days to figure out what the heck is going. It's on YouTube. And I have learned more about Romans in Britain and also about medieval stuff. They go out and dig. And it's I I think because of COVID, it suddenly became so popular on YouTube, it's so popular that people have put together money to bring it back. And their patrons, uh, Patreon is supporting the archeologists. Several of them in the original program have passed away. One of them definitely passed away. They're more fun. I sometimes eat lunch just watching one of them because they have three days to go dig up the ground and see if they can find if there really was a Roman villa there or is this where King John had his hideout? I mean, it's so much fun. But have, they you, all have you seen on, I don't know if it's Netflix, I think, um, the, the guys in Britain that, um, you know, the metal detector is called the de detectorist. Have you seen it? I don't think I've seen that one. Oh my God. It is absolutely fascinating because they go out in these fields and they, they're constantly searching for Roman coins. And oh yeah. It's 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 kind of a satire, but it's absolutely fascinating show. It sounds it's fun. You know, and what's really interesting is what they do on Time Team when they first started off was really about 2010, I think, maybe even before 2010. Huh. Uh, they ran like 20 years, so you get there's like 20 years worth of episodes. I mean, there's so many episodes, oh, and they're just really fun. But they also use early kind of ground uh, radar. It's so sophisticated now. Uh, but they also have brought in people that have detectors because they'll do a ground survey. But again, you know, archaeologists, this is another source because, you know, they're going like right now they're, ex well, you know, look at um, Montebello, uh, what am I trying to say, Monticello, you know, going back and going back to Sally Henning's room. They uncovered, you know, I think a bathroom that was actually where she lived. Uh, but again, you can find this online at different history channels of how, but archaeology can help us in yeah, recreating maybe. what we're trying to write. So that is another resource uh, that you can use. And a lot of the stuff, yeah. wonderfully, is online. Uh, maps are incredible. And like I said, I didn't really know a heck of a lot about Norway, but I actually wrote, I wrote to the Automobile Association in Norway. <laughs> I got this fantastic map that I took out when I interviewed people. So this one is Trondheim. This is from the spy map, volume one, I think it was. And then now I use Google Earth. So this is the spy map. These maps are so incredible. When I got the book back, they were up at Western. And I keep saying, will you please put it in special collections? No, it's up there in the general history area of Scandinavia. But this map helped me. 
this is the whole layout. These roads still exist today, wow. but these are important places that, um, you know, that uh, were there in World War II. They're pointing it out to the agents because these will have more details. They will show, see it's showing the main roads, what's the motor. And it, they, it, they go into detail and saying, oh, this is a gravel road. You can't go there during winter, the pass is closed. Uh, but Trondheim is so beautiful, I just love it. And I use Google Earth a lot. So here's an example, I'm writing about Bergen now. I haven't been there yet and I hadn't been to Trondheim when I wrote it. And when I went there finally, that's what one of the uh, friends of my hostess said, she said, you got my town right. And I was going like, number 42, you know, spy maps that helped me plus a lot of looking. Now you can look, you can walk down the streets. So this is the funicular. And I plan a big scene on that one. I hope to go to Bergen. I can't go this year, but I am going to go. I have to probably wait to 23. My hostess says, oh, we have a house down near there. But this is a big fjord. This is a very important place during World War II. But here, this is a scene. You can walk all around there. You can do 3D back and forth. And this is the spot right where I'm looking at. And I've also done YouTube tours on Go GoPro now. Uh, you know, a place that was heavily bombed, it's gonna be difficult. Like if you go to certain places in Europe. When I went to Vienna, I was there in 60, Christmas 66. I was a student, we went there for Christmas and St. Michael's had been bombed during the war and it was restored. So I went to high mass on Christmas Eve because uh, they were so excited after 20 years. I was there, you know, really when I think about it, it was just 20 years after World War II where I lived in Vichy for school. Uh, one of the rows of houses was bombed out still after 20 years. I also, and I also saw this plaque dedicated to 25 students who had been shot by the Gestapo, probably about 1941. Uh, that probably influenced me to write. But go to GoPro and YouTube tours, they're all out there. And um, I've been following a lot of people who are taking me around there and pointing out stuff. Uh, and I am lucky. I have been able to interview, when I first started out 28 years ago, I interviewed uh, five men and their wives who lived in occupied Norway. So this 28 years ago, they were members of the Norwegian Men's Chorus out of Bellingham, Washington. Oh my God. And, uh, I, I took pictures when I went there and maps uh, and to joggle their memories. So today, if you're talking to someone from the 1960s, because that's historical fiction, you know, take those newspaper clippings and stuff with you show ads and just sit there because it will joggle a senior's um, memories. And I am so lucky, I have Barrett. She was born and raised in Bergen. She was right by the U-boat pens. And I'm talking to a historian. I hope you'll answer back to me about these pens because I want to get it right when they were being built. But she said, oh yeah, you know, we used to take the little ferry. She worked at the photo mart. She's just telling me everything. And she's sharp as a whip. So here's another, if you don't have anyone to interview, because obviously if you're going to go back, and most people are passing, I think all the, I've interviewed many men in the Civilian Conservation Corps, they're pretty well gone. You know, I belong to a national group. But what's really cool is a lot of the museums have these on tape, and you can contact them. Uh, so, and uh, handwritten accounts. Uh, for pre-recording. I mean, you might be running something in the 1600s. My friend of mine who just passed away very suddenly about two weeks ago, she wrote about Francis Bacon and did wonderful mysteries. She was so good that she was invited by the Francis Bacon Society in London to come and talk mm -hmm. because she was accurate. And there are a lot of fun mysteries. Uh, and uh, But she was reading a lot of stuff um, that he wrote, he was a very famous lawyer uh, and other things and she wrote about him. She dressed up as him. But that's an example of really understanding your, uh, your history. Like what you're writing um, about, you know, Istanbul and places that are more foreign to us, um, you know, you, you become knowledgeable about it. You know how to present it in a way that can be, make people get more interested in what they, background of what you're writing about because it may be a part of the world that we don't think about very often 
Uh, so these are available. And you know, the wonderful thing is that during the depression, one of the things that FDR did, you, there were a lot of out of work artists and writers. So uh, they put them to work to interview. One of the most amazing things are called the slave nar narratives. They were interviewing people who had been slaves during you know, part of the Civil War. And they also did paintings. My great aunt painted for the WPA in Boise, Idaho. And I'm hoping that they saved in their, I, that's one of my little things I have to work on my little bucket list is to contact them and see if they have pictures of her paintings because she painted several murals in elementary schools and uh, I think in a post office. Post offices, yeah. And so again, you know, sometimes those post office ones are pretty hysterical. We have they one are. in Linden because they have native people in it and it's all wrong. They didn't dress like that. <laughs> they're, they're kind of living in teepees. No, they live in longhouses down here. Anyway, that's point of view, isn't it? Because it's how people interpret. So uh, technology is really important. I, had, I interviewed one guy twice because I found out he was a fisherman and he told me all kinds of stuff that I needed to know. The, the Norwegian fishing boats that was used in the Shetland bus, but this is typical, the, the thing is in the back, the wheelhouse is in the back. Uh, people dried their fish, they dried cod, they still do it today. And um, one of the most interesting thing about this guy um, that I talked to, Martin, he told me that, you know, they use copper sulfate to, um, again, this is the technology. What kind, what kind of little tiny, little passing thing that might go through the novel? It, it might be missed by the reader, but someone might go like, wow, that's interesting. And one of the things he told me said they use copper sulfate because all the nets are cotton. They're not plastic like they are today. So they can get methane on, they can build up algae. And so they would soak them in bins of um, copper sulfate. Well, it turns out that it would, they couldn't get it in Germany because it's made elsewhere. And just like we're having trouble with, you know, getting goods from China because of things are backed up back then, they didn't have that available. So he said that what we used was birch bark. And I kind of knew about birch bark because I have been spinning and weaving and I had experimented with a lot of dyes made from natural things. So there is something in the birch bark that the dye they made would break down the moss or algae that was on the nets. So they used that. Mm -hmm. And then he, he talked about, you know, one village had a phone and his girlfriend who became his wife they had the only sun, sunlight in winter, you know? So all these little tiny things, this is peat. Just like in Ireland, they, the islands, they have no trees. So they cut up peat and did their fire. So it's a tiny detail that it makes the little, little spice that you put into your writing. But again, uh, so this is another thing I'll send, the, the tech, what do you need to know? You know, I, I actually asked someone uh, I need to go from, uh, you know, my fake place, which I know is here to Trondheim. And I still have his email. He said, oh, wow, I'd only take two and a half hours on, you know, if you had a not generator on the back, because you could go up to 50 miles an hour and uh, you could use one bag to go of your charcoal in the furnace to get you there. So I had to change that because I had this long journey. Oh, no, I can get there in a short amount of time because it's summertime. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I do, I talked about before, is you can create a timeline with um, with uh, calendars. So I had a really old program, and I love this this program because it's pretty. And it was like a really this is when I finally got a computer. And so what I have on here, I create the thing. And so what you're using is the perpetual calendar, and you can go online now and find find them. And let's say you're writing about what are you writing right now. Um, Eileen, what are you working on? You're doing a sequel. Is it in the 60s again? Uh, it, yeah, but it's it's based in Cuba. Okay, so, there you go. You were asking that question too to me. Um, yeah. So is it 62? Is that what it is? Or 60 from six from 1960, actually from 1950s into 1970. Yeah. So what of, you would do is that these perpetual calendars. You might have, a, except if you go back, I think 1740, I think that's when they switched over from what the Justine to the, you know, have a different calendar since about that time period. 
So, but what you do is you put in your, your date you're writing in. So right now I'm 1942. And so you put that in, but it also may be the same layout for the days of the week and the months. Oh, yeah. 1956 or 18, I even used it for 1862. And you come up with the exact date. So what you can do is put in the actual thing. So I think I have here, this is November. And this is when the Russians started to liberate Northern Norway. This is post uh, the liberation of Paris. So Norway is very isolated. They only have 3 million people in Norway. That's how many people were in Berlin in 1940. Uh, so information does not get out there, but they, they were pushing the Germans out of Finland into Norway. That's why the Norwegian and Russian border are up like this today. They have a special treaty with the Russians. Um, but so they started liberating. So I have an historic thing happening there. I have something else here uh, of what happened with the resistance. So I put that in there and now I'm putting in scribbling in, what are my characters doing? Because this event will affect my characters. And uh, I, I really like doing it. That's the main thing about doing this is your, your characters are going through an event and uh, you now looking back have a historic perspective of what's happening, but how does it affect your character? And so I have things going on with several different characters that are in my in my story. And I find that very happening. And this is what I love. Uh, when you get all this stuff, you get really excited. <laughs> you know? Like, I gotta have smuggling Krillin women, you know, bringing in quinine because they couldn't make it in the South anymore and it was needed. They also, and they use that almost for like headaches. Uh, and uh, I think willow bark was another thing because that's what aspirin, you know, yeah it was coming in from but anyway this is a map it's so hard to read this one but this actually got from a museum this is all the batteries of the germans had in norway but you get so excited you just gotta get it in there but you can't write a story it isn't about info don it has to serve the story or a character how are they affected and it shouldn't take pages that's the hardest part you start writing your draft and you just gotta really get into it and then you realize wait a minute i can do it this way and uh, we have to, it's part of our learning process. It's in our head, it's in our notes. Uh, so we understand it. And you might put that in your author notes at the back of the book of something that this really happened, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'll probably do that for Baron Skilla. I've created a character based on him, but I will probably say something about him at the end of the book. And then I just, uh, these are wonderful authors. I've, I've actually been a monitor for Dinah Gabaldon up in Surrey Writers in BC. And I've met Bernard Cornwall in person and Perry goes there all the time. And I also have met William Martin. Uh, they do wonderful jobs with their periods. And I have to say that Eric Larson who writes nonfiction, they're almost like literary nonfiction. Um, they, they're fabulous. So what do you do with all this stuff? So let your characters tell their stories. You know, how are they reacting? They're on rations or maybe, uh, you know, during the civil rights movement, you know, talk about how you feel like you have to go into the black only part of the theater. You have to be up in the back, like in Kill a Mockingbird. I always remember that scene. Uh, everybody's up in, up in the gallery. Uh, you know, how do they feel about it? What is their internal struggle with this thing? So you keep track of the historic events that are happening, but how they react, feel about their lives. So like uh, in Mischievous, Jeannie Naughton, she's an English woman. Mischievous means captive or slave. And she is a woman in 1860. Scandal could absolutely ruin you. And that's why she's ended up in the Northwest because the scandal happened that was not her fault, but she escapes to the Northwest where she hopes that she will not be found out and known. Uh, no, and, you know, how does she feel about that? Well, women, you know, you couldn't own property. And then I also have Hawaiian characters in there, the Kanakas. How do they, how are they fit into the story? And also the Coast Salish people. Um, and so when we live our lives, we don't realize we're going through something historic. And like I said, probably, you know, in, you know, next 
15, 20 years, 50 years, they'll be writing about this period that we call the COVID times and how, how has it affected not our, ourselves personally, but maybe how it's affected our country or how we deal with something that is such a crisis. And of course, hindsight gives us that. Right. And so this was uh, my friend who wrote about Bank, Francis Bacon. They're wonderful books. Um, <clears throat> I'm so sad she's gone. Turns out, you know, you never know about a person. She was an expert in indigenous languages in Latin America. We had no clue. Oh. She's, we roomed together and uh, we were in Oxford, England together. We went to the Globe together. We saw Macbeth at the Globe when we did historical night. It was probably a highlight to be there and be there with her. She was so much fun. So we do have the internet. That's really cool. And you lay it out the same way. Uh, there are no personal interviews, so you have to search for what has been written for your primary, and then you, you also use their primary and your secondary research. And Pinterest, actually, is a very good place to get ideas. Um, so this is, the one, uh, this is the one from Thatcher's War, which is my novel about a surgeon ending up from Gettysburg to the Northwest. And, you know, I found wonderful stuff online. Uh, they have the, uh, it's the, it's the U.S. Army, I think it was published in 19, 1870 or earlier about medicine, about the Civil War, you know, how they, this is a kit that, the, but I have all my pins there. And this is this wonderful guy here. I wish you could see how hot he is, because he really is. He was a reenactor. I went for the 150th of Gettysburg. I had my great grandfather's journal entries with me, and he portrayed the doctor at this particular um, <clears throat> farm that cared for all the Union wounded. They also had the Confederate wounded in there too. And it's just wonder, he was so good. Um, I always have based my character on him. But the interesting thing is that uh, we had a historical novel conference at, uh, in ba Baltimore about four years ago. And I wanted to go because they well, he had, had Jeff Serrara, I think is how he pronounced his name. His dad wrote Killer Angels, which is an amazing book but he's written his own Civil War book. So anyway, they asked people to stand up and say, so I stood up and I said, my great grandfather was at Gettysburg. And then Anne stood up. And I'm a, I'm a great granddaughter of the Union surgeon. Her father was, I'm gonna forget his name now, but he died at this farm. I don't know if my great grandfather cared, cared for him. Um, he was kind of down in that area, but. Uh, we were both, she, her, her great grandfather, he just went out of my head, but he's very, um, Armstead, I think is the name. And uh, he, was, he was a great friend of all the union. They all graduated from West Point together. And, uh, but he was very well taken care of. He was put in the ice house at this farm. And, uh, but it was amazing. We both stood up and we're friends now. And oh, wow. I, I think the two of us should write about our experiences. But isn't that's the other thing too? Is you may have a family story or a personal story running through there that you want to have, or uh, you know, for your experiences and to and to create it. But Pinterest is great, and you can go on there now and find fashions from 1952. I bet you could find a Cuban site, and you know, um, I have to look. And I, have, and yeah. I, I just want to throw in a comment about Gettysburg. Yeah, there's a book I just read called The Witness Tree. And oh. I'm, not, I'm not remembering the author's name, but it's a dual timeline. Uh -huh. uh, and, and it's about a diary and a, a, oh. a, a, tr a tree that on Labor Day and recent time, this this tree that was uh, it witnessed the civil war and the, and the battle at Gettysburg it was there well before that and that tree was so the story is is about the tree and about what was buried under the tree and the journal and a historian that does the research you might oh, like to look it up it sounds like uh, your cup of tea oh yeah it sounds like yeah yeah there are a lot of witness trees there and in fact, the night my brother met me there, so we stayed at a B and B. We were lucky because you couldn't book anything for 100 miles outside of Gettysburg for the 150th. 
but we were lucky uh, that we got the spot. But uh, we went up there to Little Round Top, uh, and it was uh, people were in costume. You had people dressed as uh, Lee, and uh, you know, all very accurate too, I would say. And it, to be permitted to set up an encampment, my my great grandfather's name is on the big Pennsylvania. Uh, huge. I didn't realize how huge it was until I saw it. But anyway, it was so moving because we had people who were descendants dropping flowers on different places around there. It was very moving, but there are witness trees there. And uh, we actually have witness trees out on San Juan Island. There's two huge big leaf maples. They have leaves like this big wow. and it's here in the Northwest. And they're in a sense were witness trees to the pig war. They're at an English camp and one of the trees went down. They had to finally cut it down. I used to demonstrate underneath it. Uh, the other one is still there, but they started a project where they take the seeds or they can actually do the DNA, I guess, of the tree wow. and actually bring it back up. So they planted two young ones around it. You know, These things were already two years old in 1860. When the, when the camp was set up. So yeah, it's, that's, it sounds like a very intriguing story because, you know, things are witnesses, you know, they can become a character. And often when you're researching, you know, I'm looking at the weather, I'm making sure I got the weather right for Berrigan because it rains a lot. It does snow. And I have, once again, I'm in winter in Norway, but the weather is really important. That's something else you check out. Uh, you know, I had to know in Eustace, did they have, they went out in the dark. So if it's because, you know, in wintertime, it's pretty dark. So you're not running any boats in summertime from the Shetland Islands. You are, you can't do it. It's too light. You'll be found out. So, mm. but anyway, have fun. And, you know, one of the things the Di Diana Gabaldon says is, uh, you know, I have found something and now I'm going to kill you with it. But, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't do it. You have to, but mainly you just have fun and you use your imagination. So you have this sort of framework for your story, uh, but you, you also use your imagination. Part of it is really getting deep in your character. How are they responding to what is happening around them? Are they angry? Are they afraid? Uh, you know, anyway, so that is, uh, that is it. <laughs> I'm going to put us back on full view here, but I was going to tell you. Um, uh, let me get back to that. You want me to stop share? Yeah, I was going to um, tell you that I've started watching the Gilded Age, which oh, is yeah. a time time that has always fascinated me. And we had a girlfriend weekend where that was our theme, and they had a scene in it where the High Society of New York, the old New York, had a um, a fundraiser for women and children. And they had set up this bazaar in this Fifth Avenue hotel and they were selling each little booth was so beautifully curated and with fans or gloves or, and I thought about your grandmother's uh, little sewing kit. Oh yes, yeah. You know, I was thinking about you the whole time because the costume detail in the show is like, you know, the way they did with Downton Abbey. It's only, I think they've even got a step further. The costumes, the hats, the makeup, the clothes, the furnishings, the homes is so historically, I would, I think there would be, uh, be great for just a book of knowing how they put that all together. Yeah. Because it's beautiful. It's the fabrics, the, and to think that you could buy a package of these beautiful handkerchiefs with ruffles and all the stuff for um like five cents mm -hmm. well yeah. that's a, that's another thing there is something called um inflation calculator i think that's the correct thing you can actually um i'll i'll post that i'll find it and post it uh back uh on facebook it's the inflation calculator it's coming out of something called West Egg, but you can put in, they go always up to the year before. So they'll have it for 2021. So you put in the price, maybe today of eggs. How and about then, gas? <laughs> and then you yeah, have gas, and, but, you, but, but you won't have gas in 1860. No, no. But you'll put it in, let's say you're putting it in to, uh, you know, 1962 or something like that. You put that in and it will calculate 
what that was back then. So it's very interesting. Uh, I calculated the boys in the CCC, you made $30 a month. 25 went to your parents, you got the five. But that 25 that went to the parents using the inflation, uh, inflation calculator for 1935 to compare today would be over $400. Now you could rent a home in Bellingham for a month for as, I think as cheap as $10 to $15 a month. So you get an idea of the cost wow. of things, you know, that is actually, I should have mentioned that, that is a very good resource because it gives you the sense of what things cost. So I have a list of stuff they sold on Bellingham Bay in 19, 1858. Uh, we had a gold rush that happened up in Canada, but it built our town. It put our little place on the map. And um, it lists, you know, like the cost of butter. And I think it was like five cents. But today, that would be probably, I don't know, five bucks. And then you have to look at where's the butter coming from? Well, the butter came from San Francisco on a boat. Now, steamboats could, I now know that steamboats can get up to Bellingham Bay from San Francisco in three and a half days. The Ann Perry that brought the bricks to the first brick building north of San Francisco in my town, still standing, took her 13 and a half days. I also know how many bricks she carried. That was a question historians in our area knew. I found it in the Alta California newspaper. Sometimes the history, so this is a way of doing it too about Cuba. Sometimes your history that you're looking for is not in the actual place. It's in another place. And I learned so much about my town that a lot of people didn't know about. I mean, I have descriptions of my town in 1858. It's all written up by a reporter that came up from San Francisco because he's want, he wants to know what's going on. Why, why are all these miners from California leaving their jobs? Restaurant people were leaving their jobs to come up to the Fraser Gold Rush in 1858. But sometimes your history is not in where you think it is. It's somewhere else. So that's, that's a tip too. And, you know, the Cuba thing is really interesting. There must be Cuba associations, but you probably know that. Your, your husband probably has some ideas um, where you might start, so. It's, um, it'll be interesting, Eileen. Yeah, well. Well, it, th this is very helpful, Janet. You know, the organization, and I have tried some of the things that you rec suggested for my first book, and uh -huh. I realized that, you know, I need to do it differently. I need to have a better better organization and and, you gave a lot of good tips, really. Very lots helpful. of great tips. Well, you don't want to look in my room because it's a total mess right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, I mean, I've got stuff to the. I'm trying to get these pictures off to Fort Stanton, but you know, I do try to organize. I have files just right. I could pull out the book, the novel, and I have basic stuff in it, and then elsewhere. But I would say calendars, um, maps are so important. And then, you know, you may be able to find, if you needed to know how long it took to go from Cuba to say to Florida, if that's part of the story, um, you know, you can find that stuff. It's, it's out there. The internet has made a huge changer, but you have to check. You know, Wikipedia, you have to check uh, because people can put in their own history and there are actually little gremlins out there that are trying to change history in certain areas. Oh, so right you know, now, academics, you know. I have a lot, a lot of it's based on my husband's memories, but yeah. that that's, there's not, yeah, still there's not things that he doesn't remember and mm -hmm. parts and it, I like your rule of three, you know, mm -hmm. that you, you check out what, what that make sure you, I want it to be accurate. Mm -hmm. What you yeah. might check out is where your husband's from to see if they have a, a county museum. <laughs> because my father bought me the history of our county. It's in actually two big volumes. And it's got a new little thing. And, but it's got the history of all the families, the genealogy, but the only ones that are in it are the ones that submitted their story. So my father's family, who my three great grandfathers back came from Cork County, Ireland, came to my hometown and paved the streets with Murphy bricks. 
There's only one home left standing uh, made out of the Murphy bricks, but uh -oh. the bricks have all disappeared. We don't know where they went, but none of that is in the book. So this, the three things is the thing, but ancestry.com, I found a lot of information and you probably can through that too, because it's now gone international. So, yeah, I was going to say that that, uh, like at my public library, <clears throat> they have a free you know, a subscription. I don't think I can access it online from my house. I have to go to the library. But they do have Ancestry on there. And I was trying to look for stuff. I have a cousin who's really into family history. But I was trying to think also, there must be organizations in Miami <clears throat> that could um, help you to to, you might just Google that. You might just Google it, find Googling. Well, even your family church. Churches have history, family history. So uh -huh. if he was, you know, uh, was he, uh, I don't know how he was raised or anything, but you might find that they're like my church back home has the history of the families, you know? Uh -huh. So it's, you can find things in weird places because I'm writing yeah. a book about my hometown, a novel. And oh, nice. I've, been doing, well, I've been working on it my most of my life. Yeah, well, it's going to be a swan song, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> I've done a lot of research. Um, and I find out that most of the things that are recorded and printed are from the families that want it recorded and printed. The people that maybe have done the most work are never known, you know. So you have no. to get many resources. You're so right, Janet. Good for you. Well, I was going to say that just recently, I just caught it, Finding Your Roots on PBS. They just did, uh, he's a very well-known Broadway actor, but he's from Cuba. And so they- <gasps> oh, oh, you're talking about, oh yeah. That's so, so I just watched it last week. I think it's current. I can't remember. I think it came up. But anyway, they interviewed him uh, and he didn't know much because he came over as a little boy too uh -huh. and it turns out his parents were really active uh you know they you know in the government and then you know it was taken over by fidel castro but uh you might go watch that interview and possibly check where he found out the resources for that actor and it's on the <laughs> s you said pbs pbs, PBS. it's called finding the roots there's not a whole lot of anything on Cuba. I mean, there's a few television shows, you know, and everything. That's a really great subject to, you know, cause we just don't like Norway. We don't really yeah. know a lot about these places other than the politics, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, so I'm seeing a lot of what I guess are secondary sources as you call them. Um, you know, people of the generation that left Cuba that are now here and mm -hmm. their stories that are, are, you know, they're writing their stories, they're writing their family stories, fictionalized. Mm -hmm. um, so I, there's a couple of authors that, you know, I guess I could contact them too. And um, Oh, you know what I just thought of? Years ago on Good Morning America, I was kind of a judge for the best it was stories of why I'm proud to be an American. And one of the stories was of a family from Cuba that came to the United States. And it's just the most powerful story I've ever heard. But the mother and father came and they, let's see, the mother and father came, but they weren't able to bring all the children. They left a baby behind with a grandparent and then Castro's, you know, took over. So, 20 years later, even longer, the father was able to go back and he traded places with his son, the baby. They look so much alike that he grew a beard and he, they traded places and he went back. The boy went back to it, the mother and the father had to stay. <laughs> and then eventually, the man got out and he came back and it was told through the eyes of one of the daughters. Oh, I'll, I'll learn, see if I can figure out what that story was. But what happened was when the dad came back, it was very bittersweet because he got cancer and he died. Mm -hmm. But he sacrificed, it still makes me tear up because he sacrificed, his wife wanted her baby so bad that he went back and traded his life for his. 
and then the son got to be with his mother. It's a powerful story. And um, I'll have to research that and find out. That was years and years ago that I did that. And it wasn't even the story that won. The story that won was a little girl from Afghanistan who lost a leg from a bomb and was sent away from all of her family to Germany and then on to America. And they reattached her leg. Just you imagine. <laughs> and they were just telling about what America did for them. And it, to this day, just still, we don't realize well, how great our country is, but we have saved a lot of people and changed their lives forever. But I remember the little girl from Afghanistan, we got, she came and spoke to my chapter in Louisiana yeah. and her mother never did learn the language. She learned it from uh, soap operas, mm -hmm. how to speak American. And then a Chicago family took her in and got her full scholarship to college, but she went back. She went back to Afghanistan to help her people. Uh, but her mother uh, had no way of making a living, and she, but she used to sew. So my book club, the Pulp and Queens, we bought her a sewing machine and sent it oh. to her in Chicago. Oh. Um, and it was, it was just such a great story. This was back in probably 2006 or so. And then uh, Simon & Schuster published her story. But, oh, wow those stories that they told of immigrants coming to the country, ah, it, it would have been a great book in itself of all the stories, not just, they just pick one, but if they should, but I'll find out that Cuban story because I still can't believe the man, and they did, they looked just alike and they, they had him very young. So he grew a beard, you know, to make him look older and took his dad's passport and got into the United States. Isn't that crazy? Uh, it was a powerful story, but um, maybe there that resource could help you find more resources. I'll, I'll check it out. I'll work on that. Janet, thank, thank you. you. So well, fun. Fun. Thank you for having me. Wow, I learned so much. And I is some of this going to be in on the Reading Nation magazine, right? I've, I'll put in that uh, the handout. I told Mandy, she thought she could put it in the handout, but if anything you want me to write, I'm happy to write. Anything, a link or anything where we could download it or something. That's yeah. great. And Mandy, sorry that she couldn't be here today. She's got a million things going right now with oh. Million Island, Amelia Island Magazine. So uh, but thank you for coming back. Yeah. We are recording this yeah. whole thing. I will be downloading it as soon as we leave today and we'll have it up so we can watch it over and over and use it as a resource. Okay. Very good. Kathy, I, Jana, I just want to say thank you. And I want to say that even though my books are probably secondarily historical, um, there's a, there are sections in my first novel between 1942 and 1980. Um, I think that building story world, these tips can be used for any book. I can't yep. imagine not having the, the story world be accurate. And um, I just want to thank you because I'm real old school with my research. I'm old school. And, <laughs> and you gave me some great ideas for using the internet. Yeah, so I'm thank great. You. I'm glad it helped. It really does, Janet, because uh, research, 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 and the three points of view is important because usually in history, the person who won in whatever battle there was is usually right. where you get the most. And, you know, I want to hear both sides of the story. Yeah, you, so, need, to, you need to know. It can be any kind of third. So four is better. But three all more. about the story <laughs> yeah and you you nailed it so thank you thank you and uh yeah. if any authors that are pulpit queen timber guy authors out there would like to lead a workshop contact me because we're looking for more uh we want to cover every genre all different you know processes in the writing for new newbies and for seasoned professionals so Thank you for joining us, Janet Oakley. You're um, a wonderful person to do this twice. Okay. And we so appreciate you. And I look forward to all these books coming, everybody. Yes. So have a wonderful Saturday. I've got the Book and Film Club tonight. We're doing the most powerful story I've ever, never experienced in any of my theater watching. It's an India film. 
that is uh, based upon an, a couple in their about retirement years. They've raised all these children and given them all their educations, got them started in the world. And the last thing that happens is the young one of the younger child says, I need a car. And he gives the last of his retirement so this young man can get a car. And then his boss announces that happy retirement, you know, and there's nothing left. Uh -huh. And it's based in India, but it's a story that uh, I think our readership would really enjoy because what do you have? What happens to you if you have no life savings after a lifetime of living, you know, a wonderful life and and no resources? And uh, I think it's something a lot of us are all facing, especially with COVID. But it's it's a surprising. They call the children in. This is the very beginning of the movie, and they say we're going to have to give up our home. And so we've decided we're all going to come and live with you and take turns. Who wants us first? <laughs> and that's where the movie begins. And what happens is oh. very telling. The name of the book, uh, the name of the film is um, Bog Lawn. And it, it means gardener, like the seeds that you plant or the harvest. And so <laughs> you're going to get a really big surprise Indians tell the most wonderful stories but I've never I've never heard this story before and uh it's tonight at 6 30 and then tomorrow I'm kicking off my the Pulpwood Queen Shah Rukh Khan fan and film club so we're going to be <laughs> discussing another Indian film called Om Shanti Om which means um you know Om means God and it's just a wonderful it's probably the most iconic Bollywood film I've ever seen. It has everything but the kitchen sink. So um, that's just this weekend. So we will see you all at Tuesday Book Club uh, next week. And it's all up on our calendar of events. So thank you, Janet. Have a yeah, wonderful weekend. And let's get to reading and writing. Absolutely. Bye-bye, bye -bye. everybody. Bye, thank you. It's all about the story. Bye-bye. All about the story. And the research. <laughs> <laughs>